Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Jack Humphrey, and I'm the VP of Engineering at Indeed. I lead a business area we call Engineering Capabilities, and I'm, I'm lucky to be uh, based in this lovely new downtown office. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you on behalf of Indeed Engineering and our partner, the lead developer. Uh, we're excited to be a sponsor of the conference this year, and I really want to thank them for supporting us in, in hosting this pre-conference event. As I, as I said earlier, we're raffling off. If you're not already going to the conference, we're raffling off uh, four tickets uh, for tomorrow. Uh, there'll be a break where you can uh, still get your name in if you haven't, uh, and we'll do, that, uh, we'll do that raffle after the break. Um, and uh, so I know some of you are attending the conference tomorrow, and uh, for those of you who, are, you who uh, aren't, I hope you, I hope you win a ticket. And if you don't, uh, definitely check out their uh, conferences that they have coming up in New York in April and in London in June. Um, sounds like a good time of year to go to London, personally. Uh, and uh, that's at uh, dleaddeveloper.com is their website. I want to take a, a few moments now and uh, uh, introduce those of you uh, who aren't familiar to Indeed to kind of who we are. We're proud to be the number one most traffic job site in the world. We help more people get jobs than any other service out there. At the core of the Indeed experience is a, is a very simple job search. Tell us what kind of job you're looking for and where you're looking and we'll quickly get you relevant, comprehensive jobs that match your search. And those jobs will be from, the jobs that we've aggregated from every source possible, as well as a growing number of jobs that are posted directly to Indeed. We're in 60 countries, 30 languages, and we have over 200 million unique visitors coming to Indeed every month. And those, uh, those visitors have access around the world to search uh, over 20 million jobs. We're also an international company. We've, we've got offices in 21 locations around the world, and we're headquartered right here in Austin. In terms of engineering, we have engineering offices in Austin, Seattle, San Francisco, Tokyo, Hyderabad, and a brand new office just opening in Singapore. And so uh, the, the plug here, if you're interested, we're hiring all all roles, uh, all levels, tell your friends. Go to ind.com slash dash jobs is a, is a quick link to get you to more information about that. I'm really excited to introduce these talks tonight from four leaders from Indeed Engineering. We're going to be doing three uh, lightning talks, and then we'll take a, a short break, and then we'll have our keynote talk. The, the first lightning talk will be from product science manager Robin Rapp. She's going to talk about using teaching as a leadership tool. Then uh, engineering manager Paresh Suthar will uh, share kind of his experience in, in onboarding as a manager and kind of what's important and what Indeed thinks is important in onboarding managers. And then product manager Michael Mann will talk about how you can build a strong partnership between product managers and tech leads. And then after the break, we'll have uh, uh, our keynote from Kathan Gamitirkar, who leads uh, engineering for job seeker products at Indeed. And Kathan will talk about making the transition from being an engineering manager on a team to leading an organization. Thanks for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed the talks. Stick around. Um, come, come chat with us. Uh, we'd love to, to tell you more, and, uh, and, hope, and I'll be at the, the conference tomorrow. I hope to see some of you there as well. Now, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Product Science Manager, Dr. Robin Rapp. Thanks, Jack. Hi, everyone. We're so happy to have you here tonight in our Austin downtown office. It's such a beautiful space. It's my favorite office here. It's great to have everyone here tonight. Now, how many of y'all are visiting for the Lead Developer Conference? Great, excellent. Welcome to Austin, y'all. Uh, y'all? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and how many of y'all said that you were here for the Lead Developer Conference, but you're actually here because you needed a valid, valid reason to expense breakfast topics? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Correct answer, sir. Excellent. So, uh, like Jack said, I'm Robin Rapp. I'm a manager on our product science team, which is a part of our data science org here at Lead. And I'm here to talk tonight about teaching and leadership. This is something that I find personally really meaningful and near and dear to my heart. And the title of my talk here, Fishing a Manager to Teach, or something like that, uh, harkens to that saying that if you give a person to fish, you feed them for a day. If you teach a person to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. And sure, you can teach one person how to fish at a time. That's great. That's totally fine. Today, I'm going to share the value of teaching multiple people in a classroom setting who can then go and teach additional people, who then teach additional people, so your influence grows across your organization. And I think a lot of us here really enjoy these one-on-one -on -one teachable moments. Um, and we have opportunities for this all the time. It's helping write better Python. It's, hey, how do we prioritize our work? It's lifting rocks with the force. And many of us are teaching one-on-one, -on -one, even if we don't always think of it that way. I like to think of these as Mr. Miyagi moments, where you're able to take you know, wax on, wax off of a car and make it about karate. Or, hey, we're writing this JIRA ticket, let's make it about how to write persuasive arguments. But what about teaching a workshop in a classroom setting? I would venture to guess that very few of us have formal training teaching a class or a workshop in this room. And I still remember the first time I taught at university. I was extremely nervous. I was really young, not much older than the people in the classroom, honestly. They didn't know that. Uh, and it brought back that old high school nightmare where you're naked in the auditorium, or you forgot your lines for the school play, and everyone's going to see you, and ah! <laughs> Um, you know, and even after teaching at UT for five years, I still get nervous. Hell, I'm nervous right now, right? Um, <laughs> so, yes, teaching a class is hard. It's scary. It takes a lot of time. And frankly, not everyone is effective at it. But I'm going to tell you tonight that you need to do it anyway. I believe that teaching a workshop or a class or a training is arguably one of the strongest tools in your leadership toolkit for enacting organizational change at all levels of your company, whether that's ICs or SVPs. I'll give you, and by not actually teaching a workshop, you may actually risk being a bystander at to repeat mistakes being made at all levels of your company. So let me give you an example. Here at Indeed. So we send a lot of surveys here at Indeed. We really like making data-driven decisions. It's a core value for us. And to do this, we sometimes send out surveys, like quite a lot of them, actually. And that could be anything from, hey, you know, what, what do we want to make for, for lunch tomorrow? What do you guys like? What do you not like? Or, hey, how do you feel about your progress to your career? Is there anything we can do to help you across the organization? And I actually research uh, survey design as part of my degree. I kept seeing these really bad, just bad surveys in my inbox. And they kept coming. They just kind of, it was like, oh, guys, oh, it's killing me. And finally, I got the survey that changed everything. And it featured the following question. Now, I've changed the names of the teams uh, to protect people's confidentiality here. But it read something like this. With what speed? and sense of urgency, do the X and Y teams approach launching new products and enhancing existing products? Snail space, slightly faster than a snail. OK pace, rapid pace, and lightning fast. OK, let me break it down. This has a lot of problems in it. It features not one, not two, but three double-barrel questions. Hell, it's practically a yachting gun at that point. You know, you've got question wording errors, and how do I get the mean of snail's pace and lightning fast? I don't know the median, forget that. You know, there's, 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 uh, what do we got? We have at least one spelling error, if not two, actually two, thank you. Um, so yeah, this was, uh, 
This was gnarly. And I had been asked to go through the results. And the results were <laughs> essentially have a huge impact on hundreds of people at Indeed across the world. And partly through, I realized that a senior leader in a company had written this question. So if senior leaders and people you know, who were working the front desk were making the same mistakes, the way I saw it, I had two options. I could keep seeing these bad surveys pile up in my inbox, or I could do something. So I decided to use my background as a survey researcher, and I designed a two-hour workshop that would help Indians write better surveys. Now, since I introduced the workshop, it's been taken by 81 employees across the company, representing 19 different teams, and naturally, I surveyed folks after the workshop. Um, <laughs> so we found that 97% either agreed or strongly agreed that they found the workshop helpful. Um, and I stopped seeing so many bad surveys in my email inbox, which was a personal win for me. Uh, I didn't have to filter them out anymore, so that's exciting. So if offering a workshop is so effective, why don't more people do it? You know, I think there's a few really good reasons for this. First, teaching takes up a lot of time. Okay, how many of y'all have kids? Okay, great. So if you ever go to parent-teacher conferences, don't your teachers look a little tired? <laughs> there's a reason for that. Teaching takes up a lot of time. Yes, it really does. Um, it, it requires hours to be effective. You have to think about end goals and objectives and all kinds of stuff. So here's how I think about it. The first time you teach something, you have to put a fair amount of effort into it to make sure that it's actually effective. Now compare that to the hour or so you might spend teaching someone one-on-one. -on -one. The balance isn't really in favor of teaching a workshop here. I think you'd probably be better teaching off one-on-one -on -one if you think it's only a one-on-one -on -one issue. Um, but as you go on, the maintenance required for teaching a workshop over and over eventually evens out. And all you're needing to really do is make a tweak here or there, add a new example here uh, to continue to have the, the workshop be effective. Now compare that to teaching one-on-one -on -one over and over again. To put this in perspective, if I had taught the 81 employees who have taken my workshop one-on-one -on -one individually, that's 81 hours that I would have spent doing that. Compare that to the roughly 16 hours I spent teaching the workshop five times and adding and changing a few things here and there, getting some feedback, and so on. So ultimately, offering a workshop is a lot more scalable than teaching one-on-one. -on -one. You're able to offer a certain level of consistency and quality that you might not be able to maintain across 81 people. That brings us to another problem. I'm not an expert, right? How many of us have felt this in our fields? This is a really common feeling. So why should I be the one teaching? You know, I'm not an expert. Well, guess what? Neither am I. I can think of dozens of other people who know more about writing, conducting, and analyzing surveys than me. But I was pretty sure I knew more about it than the people whose emails were flooding my inbox. The Roman philosopher Seneca notes that when we teach, we learn. And I think this is really true because as I was preparing my workshop, I found that I was picking up things I had forgotten a long time ago, I was learning new kinds of surveys and methodologies I've never had to think about before. And honestly, you'll learn from your students. They'll teach you things that you would have never thought about. They'll share examples that are really weird and that you all have to kind of learn around together. And honestly, research supports that teaching is a great way to learn. And what was neat about this was after teaching my first workshop, I received the following email. I was referred to you by Paul because I was looking for some advice regarding surveys, and he mentioned you are a great survey expert. Okay. Well, huh. <laughs> that woman thought I was an expert. I guess maybe I was more of an expert than I thought. Like, oh gosh. You know, and, and something I've learned over the years is that being an expert is not binary. This is not a zero one, this is not a Boolean. It's a spectrum. Think of it this way. This is you and all the information you know on a topic. Here are the people who know more than you, 
and here are the people who know less than you. Now, if you focus on the people who know more than you, you're likely to feel imposter syndrome, right? If instead you focus on the people who know less than you about a topic, you might be perceived as an expert. All of this is to say that being an expert is not binary. It's a spectrum. And you might not feel like an expert when you start to prep for a new workshop or class, but by golly, you'll be able, you'll be able to build some expertise in a classroom setting that you wouldn't have otherwise built. That brings us to our third problem. I don't want to present for that long. I, you know, I just don't want to be there. It's, it's going to be me lecturing for like an hour. You know, none of us want to be the history teacher from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Bueller, right? Bueller. Um, and luckily, you don't have to do all the talking like he did. And frankly, you shouldn't. Uh, our brains suck at retaining information longer than 10 to 15 minutes. So the good news is that you don't have to talk for longer than 10 to 15 minutes. So good luck, Caitlin. Hang in there, buddy. And you know, really, think about how we learn to code. It's not like we learn it from a PowerPoint, you know, some lecture you know, going on, like, oh, here's how you import your packages, and then you get to your data frame, and da, da, da. No, we learn it by actually having to code, right? So we were given this sandbox in which we could kind of test things out, build some, build some things, see it, see it crash, see it burn, try again. And by breaking up things for folks in your workshop, you can give them the space where they can apply what they're learning to actual contexts. So for instance, when I was giving my survey workshop, I would lecture in 10 to 15 minute chunks and then say, hey, let's take what we've learned and apply it to a survey that you've brought to class, which made the workshop immediately impactful to their own work and also serve as a better way to learn the material than if they just heard me thrown on and on about it, Bueller, Bueller, for two hours, right? So your job as a teacher is to provide a sandbox for people to try new things and learn from one another. I'll give another tip here. It's something I, I uh, really appreciate that was taught to me. It's called the Fig Pair Share, and it's a great way to make your workshops more horizontal. It's effective for both fourth graders and 40-year-olds. And it also helps engage more introverted folks, which is really helpful. So first you start off by having folks think individually about a topic. They could be writing on a note card or a sticky note or whatever. I find that this really helps people think through what they're thinking without just like, you know, splurting something out in a bigger group discussion. Um, it also helps people collect their thoughts, and folks who maybe not won't speak up in a larger context can feel a little bit more comfortable thinking on their own for a bit. Um, next, you'll have folks get in pairs. This is the pair part of think pair shares. So it's called think pair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you'll have folks maybe pair up with a neighbor and they talk one on one about a topic. So it's certainly a lot easier for you to go, hey, let's talk one on one. Um, then I say, okay, now we're going to talk all as a group. So folks can actually have the space to uh, chat individually and, and really get a sense of what they're thinking before they come back and share with the rest of the group and facilitate a group discussion. I love being pictures. They're a great way to break up lectures, and they're great for things like brainstorming sessions or design sprints or even um, design jams as well. Here's a related problem. No one is engaged. And I don't mean this kind of engaged. Um, I mean this kind of engaged. It's becoming increasingly difficult to capture people's attention. You know, whether it's your laptops, our cell phones, our beepers, our Tamagotchis, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, there's a number of studies that have demonstrated that we suck at multitasking. Our brains simply can't do it. And you can't be present for this lightning talk and on your phone at the same time. So thank you, all of you, for not having your phones out. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you what I do for this. It's really simple. Just ask people to put them away. You just say, hey, you know, we're going to be really present for, for this workshop. 
um, you know, let's put let's put everything away. And people will actually listen to this, which is surprising to me because we seem so tethered to these devices all the time. And sometimes, you know, the folks who really need it will, in fact, say, hey, you know, do you mind if I take notes? Or, hey, you know, I have a really urgent thing that might come in. And that's absolutely fine. But on the whole, I find that, uh, you know, folks are a lot more engaged and really present and really retain the material just so much better when they're not taking notes on a laptop or giving G chats or whatever. So I'm going to sum up the five teaching tips that I've shared here tonight in the hopes that you'll take these and maybe go back and make your own workshop. So remember that teaching can be a much more scalable and consistent way of helping people understand something than teaching them one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to worry about being an expert. You'll grow expertise. Remember that being an expert is not binary. It's a spectrum. You'll want to provide a sandbox for folks to apply what they're learning so that they can really retain the information without listening to you drone on and on for a long time. Use think pair shares to make sure that everyone is engaged with the material and discussing it. And ask people to put their phones and their laptops away. So as I wrap up, I have one last thought that I'll share. If you remember that senior reader who wrote that terrible survey at the beginning of this talk, okay, well, he hasn't taken the survey workshop yet. Um, but someone he works with sure has, and it looks like this now. New products and features are launched with the right amount of urgency. Strongly disagree, just strongly agree. New products and features are launched with the right amount of quality. Strongly disagree to strongly agree. Looks a lot better, huh? That's the kind of influence you can wield when you teach. So I ask you, what will you teach? I look forward to hearing your ideas during the Q&A and happy hour. Thanks, everyone. Next up, we have Parage. We're so excited to have him. Thank you. Testing. Thank you. Uh, so I was not told that I had to be ambidextrous to run this presentation, so I hope you all bear with me. But uh, thank you all for coming out here. I really appreciate it. My name is Parage Sukar. I'm an engineering manager here at ND. And I hope to share some uh, experiences with respect to manager onboarding throughout my presentation. This basically started off as a blog post that I wrote a little while ago, and I kind of expanded it based on some of the recent experiences that I've had, as well as past experiences uh, helping to build and manage teams. Just to get a feel for the audience, are there any managers or people who have recently transitioned into management? Okay. So there's a few of you. That's good. Congratulations. You're a man. So now, well, in trying to understand what a manager is or what a manager does, we can go to Merriam-Webster and say, well, what's the definition? We have this wonderful definition here that a manager is one that manages. Not super helpful. But it does make us ask the next question, so what does it mean to manage? We'll go back to Merriam-Webster again, and we find this definition. To manage is to handle or direct with a degree of skill. Now, there were a bunch of other definitions in there as well, but I felt this one was the most appropriate. Now, most of you have a manager or have had a manager at one point. It'd be interesting to think how well this definition maps to what you think was a manager. So during my career, and uh, at most companies that I've worked at, I've typically found one of two types of managers that I would encounter. The first is a manager who would set and uh, set expectations, set goals for me, help them to help me uh, reach them, very empowering. There were a lot of common themes around certain leadership, around autonomy, building culture, making the place really fun to work at. Then there was the manager who told me what to do and how to do it. Common themes around micromanagement, not understanding the scope of work, no rapport with the team, less fun place to work at. Don't be this guy. Nobody likes this guy. So, how does somebody become a manager? 
There's usually two paths. The first path is that you're promoted into the position. This means you are recognized for your leadership talents and you got promoted to help fulfill other uh, mission and goals for the team. The second is that you are hired in to manage. This means you're brought into an organization, sometimes specifically for the skills and experiences that you have. For me, when I joined AD, I follow the second path. One thing that's really important to understand is that just because you're hired as a manager does not mean that you're going to be effective in that role. Most managers try to leverage their past experiences as the primary guide on how to be effective. I know I did this in my early days as a manager, and it's basically you go with what you know. Unfortunately, most companies and teams, they're different in some way. What worked at one place may not work at the next place. This particular point was highlighted to me a couple of years ago when I was doing some consulting for a company here in the Austin area. I was part of a team that blended developers, QA, product managers, DevOps, very nice team. The company that essentially assembled that team, they decided to assign a manager from a different group to be the leader of this team. Now, this person didn't know most people on the team, and most people didn't know what skills and value that this person brought to the team. Over a short period of time, the manager began to get more involved with day-to-day -day decision making. They would change processes. They would make architectural decisions. They would hold multiple meetings to try to understand implementation details, delivery plans. This started to erode confidence in the team. There were times when individuals had more knowledge on how to accomplish a task, but sometimes they're guided to do it differently or to do something different altogether. Ultimately, and unfortunately, this led to a stressful working environment. The manager was under stress to deliver results, and this stress got passed on to the team. It was clear that this was not a good onboarding experience for the manager. Also, it wasn't a great experience for the team. So let's talk about a better experience. Onboarding journey as a manager and a team. So before I actually started working, I had the opportunity to meet with a few people and ask them, what's it gonna be like? What am I gonna be doing? And I found out that I would be spending at least one quarter as an individual contributor. And during that time, I would write code, and unit tests, of course, fix bugs, deploy releases, participate in team meetings, and more. Hold on a second. I get to write code? It's been so long since I had the opportunity to write code, and I was really happy that someone was giving me the chance to do it. And they were going to pay me to do it. That was great. In the past, I've had to live vicariously through code reviews, technical design documents, creative utilities. But I started with Indeed, and effectively, I was a manager. And during that time, as I started, I had no direct reports. I had no management-related responsibilities. I started as an individual contributor. And I joined a team that I'm still with today known as the Money Team, where I had an extended rotation with them, and I worked as a member of the team. <clears throat> I want to emphasize that I had the same responsibility as the other engineers on the team. I learned the practices they used, the processes they used. I was following their steps on how to become productive. I was participating in team stand-ups, code reviews, grooming sessions, you name it, I was doing it. I got to know my team. So I had wonderful conversations with almost every single member of the team. I got to recognize the value of autonomy and ownership. I also got to experience the same challenges and frustrations that they ran into, because I was doing the same things they were doing. Also worth noting is I was evaluated as an individual contributor, which gave me an appreciation for how they would feel when they're being evaluated. During this time, I also got to know my manager. I had weekly one-on-ones. I got a chance to get and share feedback about the onboarding experience. I also learned a lot about Indeed's engineering cultural values. 
I also got a chance to discuss my observations and learnings about management as I was growing. So I continued to learn, I continued to grow throughout the quarter. I learned about the mission of the team and how they brought unique value to the organization. I'll also let you know that I think I gained a little bit of weight because they have a wonderful cafeteria and eat because it's free food. So that was another side effect during my onboarding experience. As I approached the end of my first quarter, I started to have conversations with my manager about switching roles. The goal of these conversations was to ensure that I was comfortable with this transition. Now, I could have gone longer as an individual contributor because that coding, I really was getting into it. I was enjoying it a lot. But to be honest, by that time, towards the end of the quarter, I'd already contributed to several projects. I'd gotten pretty familiar with the systems and the tools that the team was using. I'd grown great relationships with the team. And I felt like it was time. I was ready. So I said, yeah, this, is, this sounds like a great idea. So together, we made the decision that I would manage the money team. And I was happy about that. Now, one thing to note about Indeed is that I could have asked to potentially work with another team to manage and lead them um, if I felt there was a greater need or maybe a better fit. And if I had done that, I probably would have had another onboarding period, probably a little shorter. But in this case, I felt it was more impactful to continue building on the investments I'd already made. Overall, I think the team was happy about it too. They were able to provide feedback throughout my onboarding experience and to voice the concerns they had to my manager. And this happened before my manager even approached me about starting to talk about these transitions. So let's talk about some ideas for your onboarding journey as a manager. It's really important to know that management should not be viewed as a privilege. It's, I'm sorry, it's a privilege, it's not a title. And the idea behind this is just because you're given the role doesn't mean you're going to be effective immediately in that role. If you aren't familiar with the term serve leadership, go learn it. It's one of the best investments you can make as you become a manager and continue to be a manager. Carve out time to do nothing but learn. Work with your manager, create a 30, 60, 90 day plan for whatever model seems best for that particular organization. The key is to set and manage expectations that you will have a period of time to learn. Build trust with the team. Participate in the team's processes. Learn them, understand them. Experience the joys and frustrations with the team. Have open and honest conversations with as many people as you can on the team. And essentially, find ways to make contributions and to provide value to the team. Another aspect is to get and stay technically engaged. This might be by finding new experiments to try and gathering data. It might be getting involved with code and code reviews, design documents, technical documents. But the takeaway from this is if you're managing a technical team, it behooves you to stay technically engaged. Get feedback early and often. Get it from your manager. Get it from your peers. But most importantly, get it from your team. Another helpful thing is to keep a log or a journal of everything that you're learning. Not only is this a good reference to look back upon for your own growth, but it could serve as a guide for new managers who are onboarding at your company or your organization. Now sometimes there are challenges trying to adopt some of the suggestions that I've been making, including you're hired into the role because you are needed to fill a vacancy that was recently made open. There are timelines and deliverables that need to be met, and there's an expectation that you're going to help to meet them. Uh, sometimes organizations hire you because they believe you know stuff. You don't need onboarding. And sometimes there's just a fear of re-engaging technical work. Keep in mind, again, not all companies are the same, 
So what you will or won't be able to do may be dependent on each and every organization. It should still be possible to set and manage expectations. And above all else, if there's one thing to focus on, it's building trust with the team. If you take only one thing away from this entire talk, it should be this slide. I hope your next onboarding is a great one and that you can take some of these ideas and apply them. I'd like to thank you all again. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mike McGowan. I'm a product manager here at Indeed. And I was really excited to be asked to give this talk uh, because I really love working with the developers and the engineering managers that I have in the past. And I was really excited to share some of the learnings that I had from that. So my talk is how to stop worrying in one product. So this is a Veracruz taco. So for those of you who came just for the tacos, I recommend going there. And when I first moved to Austin, I realized that people in Austin and Texas more broadly really love tacos. And I thought when I got here, I'd get really sick of tacos. And it turns out I'd just grown to love them even more. And so I put this slide here because I love tacos. And I also love being a product manager. And I love being a product manager because I love helping engineers build products that matter. And I like to think of our relationship as being a symbiotic relationship, you know, like the clownfish and the sea anemone where together we can build really great products. So what are the benefits of building a product? Motivating your team, building products that last, and simplifying requirements. So the first thing I'm gonna be talking about is motivating your team. So first I'm gonna tell you a story about an engineer at Indeed, but before I do that, I need to give you some more background about the generation, the team I'm on, and you know, what we do. So we have, a lot of employers that sign up on Indeed to, you know, I guess to post jobs, to get candidates, uh, to use other paid products like resume or, or whatnot. And we have to decide whether we're going to keep them self-serve or when we're going to send them to sales. And it's actually my team that gets to decide which group they belong in. And the really key thing that we're looking for is whether we think they have hiring need or not, which seems really obvious because it is. But when people sign up, we often don't know if they have hired need. They may not have posted jobs yet. They might not have used products like Resume or Prime. And so it's not always clear to us whether they actually need our services. And we don't really want to send people who don't need our services. So uh, luckily for us, uh, like Jack mentioned earlier, we want to be comprehensive. And we, have, we try and have all the jobs out there in the entire world. And uh, we get that through jobs on their site. And so we kind of made the connection that it's very likely that people who sign up might also have jobs on their site. And if we can link those two, we can identify somebody who signs up before they post a job, before they use our services, whether or not they have hired need. And so that's what we decided to do. So we got an engineer on our team to use Elasticsearch to basically build a service that was going to link new people who sign up to jobs on their site. And this is what it did. What does this graph show? It doesn't show anything. And that's exactly the problem. So the first thing we did was actually start to measure what it was doing. So for almost a month and a half, it wasn't being measured at all. And this really taught me a really important lesson. So we were spending a lot of time telling the engineers on our team that the stuff that they were working on was really important but we weren't able to actually show them how the specific work and features they were doing actually led to that, you know, the value. So we can say all day, you know, your work helps employers, helps sales, helps Indeed as a business, but we weren't able to actually show and connect those two. So because we started measuring it, we saw that, you know, from then until now, we made almost 60,000 linkages, which told us employers who had hiring needs, sometimes before they even posted jobs on Indeed. And now that we knew the impact of this feature, you know, it was extremely motivating for the engineers who worked on it. And so from then on, we decided that we always needed to define how we were going to measure success first. And features were not complete until we could actually measure success. And since then, it's been a lot easier to give engineering engineers direct feedback about the work that they're doing. So this is a real chat between me and the same engineer, but for actually a different thing. 
So the next, uh, next like, big benefit of working with product is actually uh, making sure that we build products that last. So when thinking about this section, it reminded me of when I was a child and we would go to the beach and I really loved to watch the people build the ginormous sand castles. And they would get there very early when the tide was still pretty high and the sand was wet and they would work for you know, four or five hours to build these very intricate and beautiful sand castles. And I remember finally realizing that you know, they put all this effort into it and by the next day the tide would, oh, whoops, sorry, wrong tide. The tide, <laughs> the tide would wash away all the work they did that day. And I think that might be fine for a sand castle you're maybe building on vacation, or something that's just for artistic purposes, and you take a picture, and just enjoy it, and then you know, drop it. But when you're working on something nine to five, five days a week, 46 weeks a year, that's not okay. And it's actually our fault. And by our fault, I mean, it's the product and the developer's uh, job to make sure that the work that we work on is actually going to last. It's, we don't want our, their work to be washed away by the metaphorical tide. And it's just really demotivating and doesn't make you want to build great, incredible things and, and put in the extra effort if you feel like the work that you're doing might just be removed because it didn't work as expected or didn't have the impact that you intended. And how we do that is we need to be able to clearly identify the impact of the work we're going to do before we actually do it and validate that it's actually the next best thing for us to do. So at MD, we typically use data to do this. So continuing on from my previous example, we noticed that we were missing a very large population of new jobs that were coming from the applicant tracking systems. So we had jobs on site, but not applicant tracking systems. And more than 61 new external jobs were coming from applicant tracking systems. And it turned out it was actually a relatively simple change to actually enable this, which leads me very nicely into my next section, which is simplifying requirements. And to do this, I'm going to show a quick video. Behold the largest puzzle in the world. With its limited color palette and flat shading, it's a massive challenge. When built, the result is a mural featuring 32 colorful works by artist Keith Haring. Made by world-renowned puzzle manufacturer Ravensburger, this puzzle boasts 32,256 high-quality pieces. Yo, that's a ridiculous number of pieces. And these are normal-sized pieces, so the puzzle is really big. It takes about seven steps to make the 17-foot, nine-inch journey from one side to the other. And at 6 feet 3 inches, the finished puzzle is taller than most grown men. And it weighs 42 pounds, just a little bit more than a small child. <laughs> to make things easier, this puzzle comes with its own hand cart. And those crazy enough to try say it takes about 900 man hours to complete. That's equivalent to working out with 8 minute abs for 6,750 sessions. With that kind of time commitment, it's a challenge you'll want to share with family and friends. <laughs> Found it! Buy the biggest puzzle money can buy now at vat19.com. Vat19.com. So isn't that awful? <laughs> I know some people here probably love puzzles, but I, I don't know. You have to really, really like puzzles to want to do something like that. But the sad thing is this is the kind of stuff that gets dumped on engineers all the time. And once again, it's our fault to let this happen. So as a PM, I really pride myself in being able to simplify work, but I really rely heavily on the lead developer to, give me, to help me understand how complicated things are. And the way I think about this is that it's really my responsibility to understand the impact of stuff, and it's your, the lead developer's, job to help me understand how difficult are things. And when we do that, we can actually optimize and find things that are high value and not as difficult to actually deliver. So what are the benefits? We can deliver more, we can iterate more, and as a team, we can achieve more. So in recap, the benefits I was describing are it helps motivate your team, it helps build products that last, and it helps simplify requirements. But focusing on these three key areas, key areas are not only a benefit to your team, but they're also really key leadership skills, which leads me to ask, what do you want from your career? So a lot of you came here from the Lead Developer Conference, and that's maybe because you know you were you're maybe 
any video developer, or maybe you already are a lead developer and you're just trying to grow your skills to maybe become a director of engineering, or a chief architect, or maybe a CTO. And uh, when, I, when I think about this, the things I was describing, being able to simplify complex business needs, identifying the most impactful work to do next, and measuring the success of your teams, those are all skills of CTFs. And in product management, we have this common adage where we say the product manager is the CEO of the product. And tonight, I'd like to invite all of you to consider yourself maybe the CTO of the product, regardless of what you're doing right now. And it's not just because I think it's good for your career, but I also think it's gonna help you build better products. So thank you so much for listening to me, and I really hope this inspires you to work with product more and help develop some of these skills. So now, we're gonna have some Q&A with me, Robin, and Presh, and it's also gonna be kind of a, a break time. So if you need to go to the bathroom or get more snacks or drinks, this is your opportunity. Uh, but we'll all come up here and answer questions. And in about 10 minutes from now, we're gonna draw the raffle, and if you're not here, we'll go to the next person. And then soon after that, uh, we're going to do a cadence speech. All right, thank you, everyone. Anybody has a question they want to ask? I can bring a mic to you. Okay. So we'll, we'll be at the front if you have questions. Just I'll actually get started. Sorry. Mm -hmm. How are you? Uh, last week. Um, there are many ways to assess volume. What do you use primarily in terms of, you know, volume can be tricky, you know, to assessing, especially ahead of running an experiment or trying it out. So how do you how do you do that in a need or in your products? Yeah, um, that's really true. Uh, so, of course, you like I mentioned, we try to use data, but you can use data to do all kinds of things, good or bad things. So that is definitely a skill that takes time to develop. I think typically what we think about is we want to figure out what's, what are we actually trying to accomplish. I think a lot of times people come in and start saying buzzwords like open rates and click-through rates and things they just hear. When what we're really looking for is what's the ultimate value for the user, right? So at for Indeed, the ultimate value is making a hire. You know, we say we help people get jobs because that's the ultimate value. And anything we measure, we're ideally we're trying. If we did measure hires, we would. And if, in, in cases where we can't, we're always trying to measure the next closest thing to hire. Um, obviously, I work in the lead generation team, so we don't talk as much about hiring. For us, it's a lot more. Our metrics are about. Uh, getting people engaged on Indeed. We really think that once people start using Indeed and sponsoring on Indeed, we have really high satisfaction rates. So we know that like, once we get them to start spending and engaging and sponsoring jobs and buying into our ecosystem, they tend to stay and they be really excited and love Indeed. So for us, you know, our metrics are more around you know, getting the first person to start spending. So we talk a lot about the converting people. We talk a lot about uh, deepening spend. So one of our big things is incremental revenue. So we actually try and measure if we left them in the uh, free to serve group, how much revenue would they do, or would they, would they generate, versus how much is we put them in sales. So that's actually, we have a whole uh, team of product scientists on our team who actually develop models, and that's how we measure it. Because we want to see you know, if we can get them to spend more and get more engaged. So it really depends on what you're working on, but that's I go back to like, learning again. So for example, we have the system at the same time. And then you measure and assess, and you do those feedback loops to see you know, yeah. what initially you thought the value was and what the outcome was, and how do you how do you play that learning into the next? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so one thing that we we definitely do is we try to think about ahead of time. You know, what do we want to log? Because when you build a new feature, we're it's almost more valuable for us to build a smaller and less desirable feature and actually to have more logging and more data. So a lot of times we'll actually be thinking sometimes even like a step or two ahead. So we'll say, okay, we're gonna build this feature because we have some data to support it, but let's actually make sure we build in logging to answer some other questions so that we have examples of what to do next. And that was kind of what we did in this example. Thank you. Other questions? 
Hello. Uh, as a lead developer, I'm curious about um, when to begin interacting with the product manager for new ideas. I know I've been in some cases where I'll be involved very early, and I'll be able to influence things at a very early stage. In other cases, it'll be a long time the product manager is off figuring things out on their own, and they have a lot of stuff to work out before they even talk to the lead developer. Do you have a sense for when is a good time to pull in the developer, or why you would pull in the developer? What would trigger a developer to become involved in product decisions? So, so my thought would be to do, like, the earlier the better. Now, how much you need to be involved is probably the better question, right? So if he's doing 30 meetings a week or 30 sessions with users or whatever he's doing to investigate talking to stakeholders, you may not need to go to every single one of those, but having a check-in where you're asking, you know, what, what, what are you working on? What are you thinking the next product? Like, just be proactive in trying to, to get involved. So when I first joined Indeed, the lead developer that I worked with, right away it was, you know, try and engage me, ask what we're going to be building, give his feedback. A lot of times he would actually do analysis because he knew our data better than I did. He'd been, he'd been at Indeed for almost two years and I was just joining. So I think the, the sooner you can get involved and, and show the product manager that you're interested in this kind of stuff and you really want to grow the skill of building great products, they would love to have you involved. And it also helps them because they might be getting ideas that sound really great on paper, and then you might know, well, actually, our system, some other system may be easy, and this system is really difficult, and helping them understand that really early on will actually save them a lot of time better. I agree with that. Yeah. Anybody else have a question from these three? Okay. Um, uh, about teaching uh, in groups, um, I'm wondering how do you uh, have you been with a company where you had difficulty getting buy-in for doing something like that? Uh, I, I know I talked to a friend recently about experience where he worked for almost a solid week in developing some material for learning to teach other co-employees, and when it came time to present, the person said, "Oh, sorry, you don't have an hour anymore. You only have ten minutes, and uh, I'll be at the end of the conference if you're lucky." And so uh, it was a real letdown. It was obviously a bad manager. Yeah, that sucks. So it really, it really did suck for him. But uh, that's obviously about buy-in and commitment and yeah. trust relationship between. But how you uh, had conversations and what tools do you use to have those conversations? I mean, you actually kind of answered your own question there, right? You said trust and, and buy-in and relationships. I think that's a big part of it. I think a lot of it is, you know, is the need there, right? How is there has there been a demonstrated need? You know, as a sociologist. You know, you can see kind of a sample of folks, right? So if you're seeing this once or twice, maybe that's not a big need. Um, in a case where you're seeing demonstrated times over and over again, people making the same mistake, that's a case where there's likely demonstrated need, and you can reach out to folks and kind of use your network from within your company to kind of say, hey, you know, we're considering offering this this class. Does this sound like something you or your team would be interested in? collecting that in a doc, and then when it comes time to actually schedule it, say, hey, I remember you having a lot of interest in this. I'm gonna schedule it for this date. I would love for your team to attend. And you just schedule it, and you add them to that meeting, and they show up, and even if not everyone does, you've got 10, 15, 20 more people who know about your topic who prior to that hour or 10 minutes, you know, in your case, wouldn't have known about that topic. So that's, that's how I've gotten buy-in. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to build a lot of materials if there's not actually a need and you don't get that buy-in. That's really, really crucial. You don't want to spend the three, four, five, ten. 10. You know, it takes a lot of effort to build these materials. You don't want to put that in unless there's a demonstrated need for it. So in, in product management, uh, we actually, there's a name for something like that, which is uh, things like false store. So like just before you even build any presentation, you should go out and like invite a bunch of people, or like put a, a nice survey out and ask if people want to go. <laughs> and then if, you, if like 100 people should like sign up, then you know there's a need for it, and don't build anything until you have that, right? So like maybe you just actually go and find people for your class before you even make your class. Yeah. I remember Robin stopping me in the kitchen and saying, I'm thinking about doing this survey workshop. And I'm sure she got the same answer from me that she got from everybody she said that to, which is, that sounds awesome. Do it now. <laughs> Do it now! <laughs> Other questions? All right. Well. Okay, then, are you
Are you ready? You want me to do the raffle? Okay, I'm gonna do the raffle now. Oh, look. Somebody, somebody hold this for me. All right. Lucky number one, we've got four of these to give away, is uh, Aaron Evans. Woo! Ooh, yay, Aaron. We're gonna, we'll just get some more information from you uh, in a few minutes. Uh, next up. Jason Rue. All right. All right. And uh, David Moore, <laughs> you ran out of room, so yeah. more, more something. More, more era, more era. That's right. And the, the final one, just trying to shuffle them around, I'm trying not to play favorites here. Troy Rush? Ooh. All right, great. So, uh, Come see us after after Kevin's talk. We'll get a little more information, get that over to the conference organizers, and then we'll be set up for you. All right. Without any further ado, here's Kevin. All right. Cool. Thank you all for joining us. This is Quantum Leap from managing a team to leading an org. My name is Kevin Gunga Thurker, and I am responsible for job seeker engineer at Indeed. Job Seeker is pretty much what any ordinary person using Indeed would see when they were looking for a job. Just like everybody else who's spoken to you tonight, I help people get jobs. I've been helping people get jobs longer than all of them. So I want to start with a brief history of my time at Indeed. 2009, I was an individual contributor. I wrote my code, I shipped my code, Living was pretty easy. I just had to worry about myself. A few years past, 2012, uh, I had four direct reports here in the Austin office. That was a little bit of a change. It was a little bit of a jump from what I was doing, but you know, I was managing. You laugh there. 2015, oh, okay, what's going on here? I had 25 direct reports in addition to Austin. I had direct reports in Tokyo and also Hyderabad, India. This is starting to look a little concerning. Uh, we like graphs that go up and to the right. I don't know, this trend line is not looking great. Jump ahead another three years. 2018, back down to four direct reports, okay. Sounding pretty good. Oh shit. 135 indirect reports. Six locations worldwide. I have people here in Austin. I have people in Tokyo. I have people in Hyderabad. And then added Seattle, San Francisco. And somehow, I agreed to this. I also now have people in Singapore as of February. This graph is kind of scary, right? This is starting to look kind of exponential. So how, how do I deal? Like, how do I go from screaming in fear to confidently making this quantum leap? Well, the first step is understanding the job. What is this job mean? And I had the benefit a few years ago of coming across a really nice piece of wisdom. Turns out your job is not to build a product when you're the leader of a product engineering organization. That is not your job. Your job is to build an organization that builds a product. This is from Chris Gale, former VP of Engineering of Yammer, later purchased by Microsoft. I'm not responsible for building a product. I'm responsible for building the organization. So what's, what's the difference? Well, who here likes taco jokes? You like laughing at taco jokes? Yeah, yeah. Who here likes making taco jokes? Few, not quite as many, but you like making the taco jokes. Now, many of you have taken the step going from an individual contributor to a manager. So who here enjoys running a jokeria? <laughs> That's a place where you manufacture taco jokes with uh, these yahoos, right? Uh, the idea of that might make the taste of taco jokes in your mouth turn to ashes. 
And then you take that and you franchise it. And that's running an organization. So you're running a chain of chokeritos all over the world. That's very, very different from laughing at one taco joke, right? Totally different scale, totally different order of There are truths that stop being true when you go from being a manager to being the leader of a large organization. So let's go over those. As a manager, you know your team, you know your product, you know what's going on, and you know what's going to happen. Start with the first one, you know your team. You're a manager of a team. You've got a close bond with each person there, right? You know your team member well. You know her husband's name. You know her favorite taco. You know her husband's favorite taco, right? Like, you know these people backwards and forwards. You've got a really tight bond. Grows a little bit. And uh, you know some people really well, and everyone else fairly well, right? It's a larger team. You don't have to close bond with everybody that you could, but you're doing okay. It grows again. People you know really well, people you know fairly well, but there are a couple people that you, you, you barely know. You know, they're, they're a little too distant, they're a little too remote. You don't know much about them at all. It grows again. And now the people you barely know, they're nearing a majority, and there are a few people you don't know at all. You couldn't pick them out of a lineup. You couldn't recognize their name. It's like, oh, that person? Yeah. She's been working for you for six months. Really? Oh. And then it grows again. I mean, what just happened, right? Now your organization is mostly people that you either barely know or don't know at all. There are people that exist. They're working on products. They're working for your managers. And they're in a country you've never visited. You don't know their name. You don't know their face. But your decisions still affect them. You're still responsible for them. And you have to guide this organization with these people you don't even know, but you still have to value and care for them. Another truth that stops being true is that you know your product. We've all been in meetings like this. The execs in my review were out of touch with the state of my product, and were making suggestions that were not entirely relevant. We all have to go to these meetings, right, with upper management. These things happen, and you know you try to soldier through them as best as you can, and then you get back to work. It's like, geez, like what an unpleasant experience that was. It me. <laughs> this was me. Somebody wrote this about me. <laughs> and they were right. I was out of touch with the state of the product. I was making suggestions that were not entirely relevant. That's my life now. I have to figure out how to work with that. Another thing that stops being true is you know what's going on. When you're a manager of a small team, you're in touch with the people, you're in touch with the projects, you're totally on top of everything. When you're the leader of a large stuff, of a large organization, there you will be thoroughly ignorant of important things. And I'm not saying you'll have shallow knowledge of important things, or you'll be ignorant of minor things. There will be really important, really critical things happening in your organization, and you'll have no clue at all that they even exist. That's something that happens. Finally, as a manager, your life is, for the most part, predictable. You've got 90% normal stuff, and only about 10% of it is unusual. Well, when you're the leader of a large organization, that turns around entirely. It's 10% normal, and then 90% unusual. I know that woman in the middle. <laughs> I know that Do you know that go? <laughs> There's a lot of goat yoga out there. There is. Actually. There is. There's this phrase that captures this, which is a high probability of low probability events. You don't know what weird thing is going to hit you. It could be a goat doing yoga. It could be a jellyfish ski jumping. I don't know. Something weird is going to happen. And as you get a larger and larger organization, there's a lot more weird happening and you've got to deal with that unpredictability. The first step is understanding your organization. If you don't understand your organization, you can't lead it effectively. The first step is a personal one, which is coping with ignorance. There are things you can learn about your organization, but you also have to recognize that you will be ignorant of many, many things, and you have to learn to cope with that. 
Luckily, sometimes it's good not to know too much. At least that's what I tell myself every night to get myself to sleep. Ask basic questions. You've got a team of smart people who are grappling with really complex problems, and they're getting deeply into the details, deeply into the nuances. But because they're grappling with complex problems so often, they may lose sight of some of the basic questions. And that's where you and your ignorance come in. What are the pros and cons? Sometimes people get so far down a rabbit hole, you pull them back and say, well, what are the pros and cons? What's in favor of this? What's against it? You can ask, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> sometimes it's pretty bad, but sometimes it's going to be OK. Sometimes people get really wrapped around the axle about something that's not that big of a deal. Sometimes it is really important. Help, help them gain the perspective. You can ask, how hard would it be to make it 10% better? Now, I personally think sprinkles make ice cream way more than 10% better, but 10%, okay, will average the room or something. What's the backup plan? We're agreeing on doing this particular course of action, but sometimes things don't work. What's the backup plan in case it doesn't work? Now, these questions aren't all that complicated. I am basically a text file. I'm not even a shell script. You know that t-shirt that says, I could replace you with a shell script? Shell scripts at least have logic. They at least have input and output. I'm just a text file. But it turns out I'm a useful text file in these situations. Another thing you can do is challenge impossible. People who are working on technical issues, and I include my past self in this, sometimes we have this idea that something is impossible, but we don't challenge it, and we need somebody outside of us to challenge it. Sometimes it's because we haven't really tried to solve the problem. Sometimes we have a subtle misunderstanding of the problem, and we've transformed a tractable problem into something that's intractable, but also slightly off from what we want to be doing. Challenging the impossible may help people understand the problem better and realize that there is actually a path to glory. And then, of course, there's everybody's favorite executive question. Why can't we just use MongoDB? Why can't we just duct tape? And then, of course, the one of the day. Why can't we just put it on the blockchain? Yeah. Right? As an executive, that's your job. That's the kind of question you can bring. Sometimes it's stupid, but sometimes it's actually a good question that unlocks good solutions. What you bring is an understanding of what matters. What your team brings is an understanding of what's practical. And together, you marry those two to actually find a good solution. Now, you can't be ignorant all the time. You have to get some information. So how do you get the information you need? Information that comes to you is imperfect. It's what people want you to know. It's what people think you want to know. But it's going to be random, and not random according to a uniform distribution, just unpredictably random. And it's also going to be distorted, like the game of telephone, where information propagates through a series of people. And by the time it gets to the end, it has no resemblance to the original information. You have to, in short, get a clue. One of the most useful tools that I have for this is the skip level meeting. A skip level is an occasional meeting with indirect reports. That's all it is. It's not anything particularly fancy. The thing is, being available is not enough. You think of yourself as the same person you were when you were a team level manager and individual contributor. And you think, I'm the same person, you can just come up, you can talk to me, I'm approachable, it's cool. They don't see you that way. Your sense of being available doesn't necessarily mean they see you as a problem. This is Deco. Deco is a great guy. He's the CEO of Indeed, or as he calls it, the chief eating officer. Deco has the worst desk in the entire Austin headquarters. <laughs> the worst desk. It's right by the main entrance. Anybody can walk by him, and usually does. Anybody can walk up to talk to him, and usually doesn't. I've worked at Indeed for over nine years. Deco's only been around for five years. I don't walk up to Deco and talk to him. I have these inhibitions, and people are going to have those inhibitions talking to you. They don't enter open doors. Deco doesn't even have a door, and people don't cross that threshold. They say things like, Deco is busy. They say things like, he has more important things to do. 
They say things like, I don't want to bother. People have their own inhibitions that are going to keep them from coming to you, even with information that you want, even if you want them to come to you. So you have to go to your people. That means you meet them at their location. For me, that means I travel to five other offices at least once a year. You have to meet them on their schedule. If I'm not going to them in person, if I'm doing a video conference, I do it in the evening when I'm talking to Japan. I do it in the early morning when I'm talking to India. You also have to do it at their convenience. Whatever works for them accommodates their time, their place, their schedule. You could summon them. You are the boss. You could summon them to you, either in time or in space. But that sets the wrong tone for the entire discussion you want to have. You need to show sincerity, and you need to show earnestness, and you go to them. How often do you do it? Well, if you do it too rarely, you form no relationship with the people. It's this one random person dropping into their office for an awkward, stilted, weird conversation, and then disappearing for a year. But if you do it too often, you undermine their management. If you're having a skip level meeting every few weeks, that person's going to very justifiably see you as the person through whom they can affect change, that you are the person from whom they can get advice. You want to be right in that middle, where you see them often enough to form a relationship, but not so often that you undermine their management. My rule of thumb is about once per quarter. There are a couple of people that I meet a little bit more often, but I do that with the knowledge, and in fact, sometimes the request of their manager. So how do you start this conversation in a skip level? I've got a few boilerplate things that I go through just to set the stage. I say to them, this isn't the only time we can meet. Feel free to reserve time on my calendar. That's because you don't always choose when somebody has a need. You can't schedule that quarterly. <clears throat> Part of building that relationship is not just being available at a scheduled time on a quarterly. It's also being accessible when they need. If they don't want to go to a meeting, I say, you can always send me an email. I can't always respond quickly, but I will respond. People are often reluctant to even send an email. Not just walk up to you and talk to you in person, not just put something on your calendar. Sometimes they're reluctant to even send you an email. And so I give them permission to do that. I say, if I forget something I owe you, you can remind me. I'm responsible for these people. I'm accountable to these people, but I'm also a forgetful, busy person. I tell them, I will take no offense if you remind me that I owe you something. Because I made a promise I need to uphold it, but sometimes I'm imperfect. I say to them, if it's important to you, it's a good use of my time. If I'm a leader of anything, as the leader of an organization, I'm a leader of people. To do it well, what matters to them has to matter to me, and they have to know it. It doesn't matter if it seems trivial in the grander scheme. If it's really important to them, I have to value that as a leader because I want to help them be successful. I want to help them work through whatever obstacles stand in their way. In a skip level, the focus is on them. <coughs> I'll ask a number of questions, but I'll start with, what do you want to talk about? I want them to feel ownership over this meeting. It's not me coming in and interrogating them. If we have a little trouble getting started, I ask a few other questions. How do you like your work? I want to understand if they're engaged. I want to understand if they're satisfied. <coughs> I ask them, how do you like their team? This is useful in understanding how they feel, but it's also useful for me to suss out any potential conflicts or dysfunctions on the team. What advice do you have for your manager? In some cases, I'm that manager's direct manager. In other cases, I'm the indirect manager. Sometimes people can speak directly to their manager and communicate what they need from the manager, but a lot of people have inhibitions with their manager as well. They don't provide the feedback. They don't provide the criticism. They prefer to wrap it for me. And I know their managers. My managers in my organization, they're great people. They want feedback. They want advice. But they're not necessarily going to get it because people have these inhibitions. If it can be routed for me, that helps them be better managers and better professionals. Do you understand your purpose and our strategy? Everybody wants to feel a sense of accomplishment. Everybody wants to understand that their work is adding up to something. Michael talked about that earlier. So I want to make sure that they understand how their work fits into the overall purpose and strategy of the company. Are you happy with your direction? We're in a very active time for software engineering, 
People can take jobs for lots and lots of reasons beyond money. In fact, they have a luxury of doing so. They have goals, they have growth, they have different things that they want. And I want to make sure that they're happy with their direction. It's not just about the money we pay them and the benefits we give them. I also use this to ask for feedback. I find the best way to get feedback is not to wait for it, it's to just go and ask directly. So I'll ask, how am I doing? I may not know them very well, I may be their indirect manager, but I am to a degree somebody that they know about because they see emails from me, they see direction from me, they see me doing all hands meetings. So I can ask them, how am I doing? I can ask them, how would you like things to be different? This is pretty open-ended. It could be their product, it could be their team, it could be their personal role, it could be the strategy of the organization. How would you like things to be different? Are there areas where I could do better? And I stress here that they're doing me a favor by providing me this information. I want to be the best leader I can be, but I can only be the best leader I can be if I understand what they're seeing and what they think I can do better. How do you think the organization is doing? In a sense, this isn't about me personally, but on the other hand, if I'm leading the organization, how the organization is doing is very tightly tied to how I'm doing. And so I can get another lens on how I'm doing by making it not about me, but about the organization. And that may make it a little bit easier for them to overcome their ambitions. What should I pay more attention to? I'm going to be neglecting a ton of things all the time. That's a necessity. I may not be making the right prioritization decisions. They can be giving me input to steer my attention to where it's needed. A key part of these skip levels is to listen more than you talk. Let them drive. Let them take the conversation to what they think is important. Sometimes you need to nudge them. Sometimes you need to give a little bit of direction to pull them back on track. But for the most part, this needs to be their discussion. You let them drive. Another thing is don't commit to change. You are sincere, you're listening, you're attentive, but you are listening to a single point of view, a point of view that's inevitably biased because we all have bias. You need to gather more information from different parts of the organization and you need to think about it. The most you should promise is to follow up on something, but don't promise to change in these meetings. That's not what they're for. Be friendly. You want to be warm, you want to be engaging, you want to be attentive. A lot of people are going to be intimidated in these conversations. And the more friendly you seem, the more it's going to be impossible to turn this into a relationship, as well as a single productive discussion. If you seem cold, if you seem disengaged, if you seem disinterested, they're going to clam up. They're not going to have anything for you. And then don't argue. This type of meeting is not the time to change minds. It is far, far more important that people feel comfortable giving you feedback than it is for that feedback to be accurate and correct. Remember, you're building a relationship here, an ongoing relationship with people. If you argue, even, even if you make statements, I recommend you make, avoid making statements in general because the more you express your point of view, the less they will want to express their point of view. You may be preemptively shutting down discussion because you've made an absolute statement about something they feel differently about, but now they're afraid to contradict the boss. So try to avoid making statements in general and definitely don't argue. Listen and understand. You also want to hear the message behind the words. You're doing all this work to reduce their inhibitions and make things more comfortable, but even so, there may be some still left behind. So you want to hear the message behind the words, not the words they're saying, but what their tone indicates, what their subject indicates. So they could be saying, I'm unhappy, but without saying that they're unhappy. They could be saying, I hate my boss. He's a total jackass. I don't know what they call that in British. I'm calling him a jackass. Um, they could just not understand what's going on. It could be the technology, it could be the strategy, it could be what the product is for. Or they could just be stuck. I feel stuck. <laughs> And I'm not going anywhere. Um, fire department, excuse me. In case you're curious how that ended up. <laughs> this is uh, so yeah, real role model there. You also want to pay attention to what they're not saying. There's uncomfortable body language. There are terse answers. They're equivocating. Oh, well, you know, maybe it's not that much of a problem. They're not making eye contact with you. They're changing the subject. 
you ask them, you know, how are things with manager? They're fine. Um, what What do you think we're going to be working on next quarter? That's that's a big signal. If they're uncomfortable, there's probably some issue that they have difficulty talking about. It's just like a regular one-on-one, -on -one, except it's a little bit worse because they may also be uncomfortable talking to you. They may be intimidated by talking to their boss's boss or their boss's boss's boss. So you have to do a little bit more than you would in a typical one-on-one -on -one to work through this and pull it out. Then there's bad news. The thing about bad news is you want bad news to a degree. As Robin might say, don't go praising for fish. That's not what the purpose of this meeting is. You are not here to hear good news about yourself. You want to hear some degree of bad news. Because bad news is good news. It means that people are comfortable talking to you. They're comfortable saying, you know, I don't think this product is actually going to succeed. Or we're not going to make our date. Or this change that you've made us go through, we're moving everything to AWS, I think that's a bad idea. If you're hearing that disagreement, if you're hearing bad news, like it's taking twice as long as you expected, that means, if nothing else, you're doing a decent job of keeping those communication channels open. If they're telling you bad news, it means they trust you. It means that they feel safe. And it means that you, they believe that you can actually do good things about this negative situation they're reporting. Getting just good news is bad news. Because there's always bad news, especially in a larger organization. And if you don't hear it, it's because people aren't telling it to you. That's a leadership failure that you need to fix. It's your leadership failure that you need to fix. And then finally, remember that feedback is a gift. At the end of every skip level, I say thank you. And I really mean it. These people are helping me do a better job. They're helping me do more for myself. And they're helping me do more to help people get jobs. This is a gift, and there's no other way I can get it. So I say thank you, and I mean it. Now you've gotten this organization, and you have to lead your organization. One thing that's really important is your organization does not exist to obey you. There are a lot of metaphors that people have about organizations, like the brain and the arms and the legs. And of course, the leader of the organization is the brain. If I was the only brain in my organization, we would be in so much trouble. That would be a really bad thing. We would not be helping people get jobs. People should not do things because you command them. People should do them because they believe in them, the projects that they're working on, the direction that they're going. Occasionally, some people should do things because they believe in you, because you've shown a track record, because you've shown that you have good judgment, that you value them, and they believe in you, and they're willing to take a leap. But you should almost never be this guy, the one who says, just do it. Actually, there are a lot of reasons not to be this guy. I'm going to focus on that one. <laughs> so getting things to happen the way you want requires trusting the people and getting them to buy in and believe. And a good part of this is effective delegation. So when you're delegating well, what happens? Well, you should only see tough decisions. This one, every time I go to a grocery store outside of Austin, because Austin doesn't have plastic bags, they ask me paper or plastic, and I just stare. <laughs> it's, it's a really tough one. This is the only kind of decision I should be seeing as a leader of an organization. I should not be seeing easy decisions. If I'm seeing easy decisions, that means I haven't delegated to my team properly. What does proper delegation look like? Well, there are three ingredients. These aren't the only ingredients, but there are three key ingredients. There are the goals, there are the constraints, and then there's the authority. The goals are what the outcome you'd like to see is. The constraints are things that shouldn't change, things that they have to operate under and can't move. And then the authority is saying you can make these decisions and letting other people know that they can make these decisions. It's not exactly what task to execute, exactly when to execute, and exactly how to execute. That's not delegation. What can they do, the people that you're delegating to? What can they do without your action, where you have to open a door or enable something or do some work? What can they do without your permission, 
they have your trust and your confidence to just go and do it. And then, what can they do without your knowledge? What can they take a care of without ever bubbling up to you in any form at all? What you want to expect from this is that people are going to do things differently. That's part of the purpose of delegation. It's not for them to do things the way that you would do them. It's for them to do things successfully, whichever way they can find. You want to find leaders who are different from you. Maybe they're more aggressive or more cautious. In my management team, I have both. They could be more impulsive or more deliberate. In my management team, I have people who are more deliberate. I'm kind of the high water mark on impulsiveness. You can have people who are more focused on people or process. And again, I have people in both categories. And people who are more intuitive or more analytical. I have people who are more intuitive. That's as far as that one goes with me. Now that you're leading your organization, you also have to discover what to change. You start with understanding what I simplify into three categories of organizational performance. There are results, effectiveness, and health. Results are what they pay you to do in the short term. Is the work complete? Is it on time? Is it on budget? And is it at the required level of quality? That's the immediate output. That's what you're trusted to deliver. But there's a short term aspect. You also have to look a little bit longer term at your organizational effectiveness. That has to do with the speed of delivery, the predictability of delivery, how efficiently you're operating, and what the capacity of your organization is. These don't necessarily influence your results today, but they're going to influence your results tomorrow. You may deliver well today, but you need to sustain them. And then even longer term is health. Is your organization engaged in continuous improvement? Are the people in your organization happy? Is your organization growing and expanding as it needs to meet the business? Are the individuals in the organization experiencing professional growth where they gain knowledge and skills? And then, how is the satisfaction in your organization? Do people feel a sense of accomplishment and a sense of pride with the work they're doing? You do a diagnosis, you understand how you're doing, and then you need to make fixes. One way not to do that is leadership by editing. That's where you ask for work, you get the work back, you review the work, and then you request improvements to it. Oh, uh, I think you need to consider international markets as well. Or we need this to scale to 10x our current product, not 2x our current product. And then they go to the beginning and they do it again. They make the requisite improvements, they deliver the work, you review it, and then you're like, oh, uh, we, need to, we need to support Turkish, which has a weird eye. In, any, in case anybody has had to localize to Turkish, they have a weird letter I. Or we need to support Arabic and Hebrew, which are right to left language. They go back, they do it again, and the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. And you see people's souls wither and die as they go through this leadership by editing. It's demoralizing, it's slow, and it's inefficient. You as a leader, if you are engaging in correction after the work, that means you gave bad guidance before the work. This is a leadership failure. It's probably your fault, but even if it's not your fault, it's your responsibility to fix it. A risky, risky thing is that intervention is addictive. Somebody comes to you and they have an architecture for something. You're like, oh, like, yeah, yeah, you didn't address this case. We need to be multi-data center worldwide, not just a couple of regions of the US. And you think, yeah, I've still got it. I'm not some out-of-touch executive like that joker said 25 slides ago. I've still got it. I can still do it. I can contribute. But the thing that happens as a result of this is you've patched the output. You have fixed the result of this work, but you haven't fixed the underlying cause. So it's going to happen again and again and again. The problem is, I felt good about this. I felt like I still got it. I don't care if I had to shift code in five years. I was vital. I was valuable. And you've got to resist that sense of satisfaction because it's like scratching a mosquito bite. It feels good now, but it's going to bleed later. So you want to monkey patch your organization. Monkey patching for anybody who's worked in Ruby or Python, as well as other languages, but that's where it's most common. It's modifying a program while you're running it. You can do it in other programming languages as well. 
I'm saying you can do it to your organization. The thing is, if it's wrong, you need to figure out why it seems right to the person. They thought they were producing good work. You looked at it and you saw something wrong with it, but they thought they were producing good work. So you have to figure out why it seems right to them. Everything anyone does makes sense to them. They could be sculpting out of mashed potatoes, but this means something. This means something. You've got to figure out what's going on. The root causes could be skills. They could be the information that the team has available to them. It could be a misunderstanding of priorities. Maybe you don't have the right people. Or it could be your leadership. Regardless of what the root cause is, your leadership is what has to take you out of it. You've got to fit the fix the root cause, so you're not patching the same problem over and over and over. Now that's about keeping things running and fixing problems as you see them, but you also need to drive change. Every organization can be better. That's kind of an empty platitude, it's true, but every organization can be better, and as the leader of the organization, making it better is your responsibility. And you need to change ahead of need, not just when it's evident. If everyone sees the need, you waited too long. You've got to push the need before it's apparent. If the need for change is visible and obvious to every single person in your organization, you have failed as a leader. You needed to anticipate that change a quarter ago, a month, a year ago, five years ago. That means you're going to meet with resistance because you're trying to change things that seem to be working just fine. Because you're looking ahead to a future where they don't work anymore. One of the tools that you need to employ regularly as a leader is repetitive communication. One of the tools that you need to employ as a leader is repetitive communication. Repetitive communication is one of the tools that you need to employ as a leader. Which is repetitive communication, one of the tools that you as a leader need to employ. You need to figure out your message. What direction do you want people to go in? Where do you want them to head? And then, you need to make it simple. Did you make it simple? No, it's not simple enough. You need to make it even simpler. You need to eliminate the nuance. What you think you say, and what you actually say, and what they hear, all have to be the same. And you might be doing this via text. You might maybe be doing it in a verbal conversation. You may be doing it to people for whom English is their first language, or maybe their second language, or even their third language. So you need to make this message really, really simple and really, really clear. But you also need to adapt the message to the time, place, audience, and situation. You want to repeat without sounding repetitive. Don't say the same words every single time because otherwise people will tune you out. So you need to stay on the same simple message, but you need to adapt it for, to the particular situation that you're involved in. You do it in Spanish. You do it more colloquially. You do it at the Austin Pride Parade that indeed sponsors every year. Sometimes you turn into a question about a particular direction. How many people would you be able to help get jobs? Sometimes you hit on Whoopi Goldberg in the center square and just move on from that. Her time has passed. Sometimes you're working from the other direction. One person got it. Thank you. Um, and you're actually helping jobs get people. You can ask questions. You can ask about the direction. You can ask about the future. But all of this is about getting people jobs. I'm not saying the same thing over and over, but in a sense, I am. But I'm adapting it to the time, the place, and the situation. So what is this job like day to day? You know, it's a fancy title. It's a bigger paycheck. But on a day to day basis, what is it actually like? Well, I've got great news. You will constantly be failing. Just over and over and over, you will be failing. Failing harder than you ever have failed in your career. The need that people have for you is infinite. And your capacity, I'm sorry you seem like great people, but it's less than infinite. You have to figure out how you're going to do less than is needed of you. There are few easy days. Very, very few easy days. And that's because of a very interesting phenomenon uh, very well put by Greg Lamond, the two-time winner of the Tour de France. It doesn't get easier. You just go faster. As you build skills, as you gain knowledge, as you become a more effective leader of the organization, you don't throttle back to 50-hour weeks. 
or that 50, 40, 40 to 30, you find more things to do. You got into this position because you're eager to accomplish things, because you have a work ethic, because you have drive. So instead of things getting easier, you just go after harder things. You go faster and faster and faster. There are also no normal days. All of the days are different from all of the other days. You don't have the consistency that you did as a manager. Here's a sample day that I had not long ago, practicing for a talk. Geez, I hope that goes well. <laughs> Assembling an offer for a candidate, investigating an outage, discussing the strategy for a new office, that was Singapore, talking to a potential acquisition target, discussing a change in our product direction, dealing with somebody quitting in your organization, talking to an external service event, and then on top of it, the routine one-on-ones, skip levels, stats meetings. But that routine stuff, it's at the bottom because it's actually a minor. There's a high probability of low probability events. Every day is going to be different from every other day. You also need to beware side effects in this job. There are unintended consequences. As we all know from Spider-Man, with great power comes bad aim. <laughs> That's a joke within a joke within a joke. <laughs> so what happens is that shouldn't replaces can't. You used to have all of these hard constraints on what you could do. Now they become soft constraints. You think about morale, you think about politics, you think about boundaries, you think about all of the unpredictable consequences of the choices that you make. Because you're making choices for dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people. You can't think through all of the ramifications of moving to the cloud, or adding MongoDB, or doing it on the blockchain. You just can't. There are going to be unintended consequences, and they hem you in far more effectively than any hard constraint will. These constraints increase faster than power. You will have less freedom and less control. I have less freedom and less control than I did when I was an individual software engineer. I could write the code. I could ship the code. I have very few dependencies on other people. I could decide to a large extent what to work on and how to work on it. I didn't have the same constraints. I had the compiler to satisfy. I had the tests to satisfy. But those were easy compared to politics and unintended consequences and morale and organizational health, business partnerships. There are a lot more constraints, and they grow a lot faster than your authority. There's also the issue that your words have weight. A casual comment will be taken seriously. Hey, what do you think if we did tech talks the night before the lead developer conference? Just throwing that out there. Oh shit, I have to do that? All right, here I am. Or a suggestion sounds like a command. What do you think about distributing tacos on the blockchain? Just throwing that out there and then six months later, you're in a presentation where people are telling you how they've distributed tacos on the blockchain, and you're thinking, what happened to helping people get jobs? I was making a joke. Um, yeah, or neutral. Neutral sounds disagreeable. Somebody gives a presentation, somebody pitches a product idea, and you say, yeah, I think that was okay. What they hear, I'm going to be fired. <laughs> neutral, when you're in a position of authority, has heavy, heavy weight it's going to sound negative. You have to be afraid of these consequences, but you also have to work through them. Well, what you can get done, that's another important part of this. You know, 5% is celebration. You're working with your team, you're high-fiving. By the way, shout out to Getty Images for helping co-sponsor this talk. They got a lot of kind of weird shit. <laughs> go, go digging through. But 5% of the time, as the leader of an organization, you're actually getting things nicely accomplished. You feel a sense of pride, a sense of satisfaction. Everything's gelling, everything's clicking. 20% of the time, 20% of the stuff, you're just barely avoiding disaster. Like you landed the plane, where, where are the wheels? Where's all that smoke coming from? Is this thing ever going to fly again? It landed. Nobody died. And then the rest of it. <laughs> and you've got to be able to sit there while everything's burning around you and think, this is fine. This is, this is fine. Yeah, yeah. 
another, another racer, different kind of vehicle, said, if everything seems under control, you're not going fast. Well, that's kind of what this life turns into. And it's exciting, it's thrilling, it's great, but it's not necessarily for everyone. There's some real difficulty to this. There are other difficulties. Failure rolls uphill. Anything that goes wrong in your organization is going to come to you. Victories stay with the team that earned them. Everything is too slow. You want to affect change. You want to deliver product. You want to hire people. Everything is too slow. And part of that is because you're five steps removed from any actual action. You manage someone that manages someone that manages someone who writes software that helps people click on jobs that they apply to that they eventually get. You're so far removed from everything that everything is going to take way too long. And it's also going to be too hard. Everything takes a lot of effort. Meanwhile, you've got 10 things that are shouting as your number one priority. There are 10 things that are all, I'm number one, I'm number one, I'm number one. And don't even get me started on number two priorities. They're even worse. And then the workload is infinite. Everything adds up. And each individual thing may be small, but you add them all up and it's infinite. And your capacity is finite. In a sense, you're adulting, but you're adulting to the max. <laughs> Everything that you're doing as an adult, being responsible, being overwhelmed, being busy, wondering where all your time went. What are all these bills I have to pay? That's what this job is. Another really painful thing that happens in this job, if you succeed, it's because you have a great team. A great team that can work together, that you recruited, but fundamentally, <coughs> They did. You may have trained them, you may have given them guidance and tips, but they're a great team and that's why they got the gold. If you fail, it's because you're a bad leader. That's how this works. The team wins, the leader fails. And if that's difficult to accept, which it should be, it's a really challenging thing, this might not be the job for you. So how do you get from here to there, assuming you still want to? You have to learn constantly. This is a job that is about people. Computers are simple compared to people. And groups of people, groups of people are even harder to deal with. So you have to be learning constantly. There are tons of resources, podcasts, books, talks. Be learning constantly. You need to become an astute observer. An astute observer of projects, of people, of groups, of body language, of emails. You need to become an astute observer to pick up on the different signals that are coming to you. Many of them are really, really subtle. You learn the job before you have the job. And that's actually pretty convenient because a lot of the skills that go into being effective at this job, you don't need to have the job before you get it. So you get a lower risk trial, trying out the individual pieces of the job. Get a mentor. Find somebody that you respect find somebody that is accessible to you, or maybe seems inaccessible, but what does it hurt to ask? Just walk up to them and say, will you be my mentor? I, I admire you, I respect you, and I think I could learn a lot from you. Some people have done that with me, and it's been very flattering, and they come back for a second meeting. Usually it takes a few too many drinks at the Christmas party before they do it, but they do it. Go up and ask people, they want to help. Somebody wants to be your mentor. Try the pieces of the job in your day job. Little bits, little bits, observe, coordinate, do skip levels in some fashion. Read body language. There's a lot more to learn. <coughs> Managing managers, driving change, change. Strategy, dividing responsibility, dealing with adversity, learning when to get involved, and doing measurement. And this isn't an exhaustive list of topics, but each of these is a separate talk in and of itself. There's a ton to learn, but the great thing is nobody has learned it all. Nobody has mastered it all. I certainly haven't. So, you know, all you have to do is learn some of it and keep learning. The great management guru Peter Drucker said, only three things happen naturally in organizations. Friction, <clears throat> confusion, and underperformance. Everything else requires leadership. And when you attain that level of leadership, when you can guide an organization and a team to accomplish great things, it's amazing 
it feels great. It's awesome when you lead your team to victory. That makes it all worth it. And this leadership, it you. <laughs> all right, that's all, folks. Thank you. Before we jump into Q&A, I'd like to announce our next tech talk. It's the art and science of product metrics with our head of data science, Donald McMahon, here in the front row, Whoa. and some devilish, devilishly handsome other fellow. Um, that will be on May 30th at our Austin headquarters, which is over off uh, 360 and 2222 at 6.30. So uh, the gentleman who was asking earlier about product metrics, this might be something that uh, you'd be interested in. So hope to see you all there. And uh, that's the end of me, except for questions. Any questions? It's all right. You can ask questions. The taco stands are open until like midnight. Mm -hmm. Is there one down here? Yeah. No, no, no. Um, so I was manager for about a year, and one of the toughest things for me was I was in so many meetings, I never had any time to prepare for meetings. But I, but I really liked the idea of preparing, because coming into meeting blank was always disastrous, or could be, you know, thinking you know, all your work in the meeting. How do you balance that? Do you have a sense of, I reserve time for myself between meetings, or are you really, meetings are a way of working things out in the meetings that work out for you? That is a brief question with a lengthy answer. Um, the, one, one of the simpler things to start with is block off time on your calendar. So just defend your calendar. It's totally okay to put something on your calendar and just be like, sorry, this is blocked off. Um, so that gives you the time. Your calendar, you should, you should be willing to do things, right? That's your job. But you should also aggressively defend your time and prioritize. Nobody's going to come to you and say, don't go to that meeting. You're trusted to make that decision. If you can say yes, you can also say no. And so block off time in your calendar, make time to do it. Um, I also, you know, I really like what we do. I really like how we do it, so I spend a lot of time thinking about it um, while I'm driving in the car, when I'm taking a shower. Sometimes those aren't work-related, and I post, post them on uh, Reddit shower thoughts. Um, but, you know, time to think. You need it, and if you can't find it while driving or taking a shower, just block it off. Preparation time um, is important. Um, in terms of the meetings themselves, I tend not to go to meetings if I don't think I'm going to add any value. Um, I remember a meeting uh, a year or two ago when uh, we were going to move Indeed to SSL, and I walked in the room and I saw who was there. Jack was one of the people there, and I thought, if I was the only person working on this project, I might add something. I looked at the brain trust in the room and I thought, I mean, I'm curious about this, I'm interested in this. I'm adding nothing to the people who are already here. So I just kind of bowed out and I said, you know, like this seems very well under control. All I can do is slow things down, so please disconnect me from the future meetings. Um, and I also, when somebody invites me to a meeting where there's not a clear goal from the meeting that I can infer or that they've explicitly told me, I send them a reply saying, hey, you know, I've got a lot of things to do. Can you help me understand what you want to accomplish from this meeting? And if I don't get a good answer, I'll be like, all right, well, I don't know if I can really help you. Best of luck to you. Yeah, people put things on my calendar just to ask me simple questions. I'm like, is this, what's this meeting about? And they're like, oh, it's about this. And it's like, OK, well, go do that. Like, do we need another meeting? No, awesome. <laughs> That's my favorite kind. So um, in that transition, right, that you highlighted, what has been hardest for you? Like going from that first leap and digital computer <laughs> To that sort of within pro managing project, right? And then the second week to more of managing outside where you lost touch. So in those two areas, or well, well, the two phases, what could you say was hardest for you and easiest for you coming from a developer? Yes, I would say hardest for me was uh, having some semblance of competence at the job. So still working on that. Um, for me, I think the hardest thing to do is sustained focus on the operational aspects. So um, I'm, I'm more of a vision type of person. I like big ideas and, hey, let's go do that. 
but the you know week to week, month to month. All right, we said we were going to be at 10% by this point, but we're only at 8%, and that methodical aspect. That's one that I personally have difficulty with. Um, I think because I get bored a little too easily. Um, so for me personally, that kind of high level stuff is difficult. As an individual contributor, I you know I learned how to be fairly methodical. I learned how to be fairly reliable and estimate and you know bang things out. Um, but I, I find it a real challenge to do that for others. Sorry, I, I can do it for others in a micromanagement sense, but uh, doing it with the right degree of remove from it is one thing that I personally find challenging. Um, there, are, there are operational things that sort of marry the operational and visionary, and so that has to do with things like regular all hands or regular communication to the team. Here's our updated direction. Those are also things that never really get to the top of my priority list. My, my priority list is dominated by weird and urgent things, but the important and normal and less urgent things, it's really easy for them to just slip just below the cut line and not get done. Other people have different challenges, those are mine. Just a quick, since you came from the developer, I guess, uh, actually, you were initially a developer, do you ever see management in some ways? I know it's people instead of systems, but it shares some of the architectural elements of information, data exchanges, organizational structures. Do you ever think in those terms? I'm just curious. I do think in those terms, and I worry whether it's a little uh, pathological to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, like you, I don't, I don't see people, I just see nodes in a network. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, something like that. Um, but I mean, you some of the see, same problems you solve sometimes. Yes, systems, you definitely see some of the same problems. Yep. Yes, there are definitely excellent metaphors between running an organization and creating a large scale computer system. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I used the monkey patching metaphor, right? Yeah, you so, did. Yeah. There's one back here, and then we'll come back. Hey, how's it going? Uh, my name is Kevin, and I'm a former high school math and computer science teacher. Um, and sort of transitioning into tech, just did a data science uh, immersive at Galvanize. Um, I appreciate the talk, um, especially your kind of um, points on having a degree of separation and, and being, having to talk to your employees um, or folks that you barely know or are trying to meet. Um, I guess you said one thing that kind of caught my attention, two things. So the first thing, one of the things you said was, your words have weight. Um, so just make sure you are aware of that as you say things and you're, and you're giving feedback. But another thing you said was um, that when you go into a meeting, don't argue. And so I'm wondering how you handle, like, you know, if, 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 it's not, if there's a sign of good leadership and you have a lot of bad news, People are saying, "Oh, don't you know? Don't you know? Take everything to AWS, or don't switch over to this, or you know." And so you're getting that, um, or maybe having some complaints uh, given to you. Um, do you give a positive affirmation? Um, how do you handle that like ambiguity there, but balancing that with you know your words have weight? Yeah. So first off, uh, thank you for teaching high school math and computer science. There is a straight line between my high school computer science teacher and me being here right now. Like, I just chanced into it, but he was a great teacher. Uh, I'm still in occasional touch with him, and he changed my life. So maybe you changed somebody's life, too. Um, with respect to what you were saying, uh, the don't argue, um, people who know me are like, wait, you say don't argue? <laughs> I've never experienced that. <laughs> I, I like a little debate. Um, I was referring more specifically to the skip level meetings, okay, so not in general, because the skip level meetings, you want to have a free flow of information, but somebody who has a lot of anxieties and inhibitions about communicating with you, and you're trying to build a positive relationship. Um, in other situations, you can be a little bit more argumentative, or let's say productively discursive. Um, you still want to be a little bit careful about that, and you know, uh, I, I cut this due to time, but there was, there was a point about Socrates in here, uh, being Socrates rather than Steve Jobs. You may have a point, but you want to gently lead people toward it through asking the right questions and suggesting aspects that they haven't thought of, but not with a direct frontal assault like, well, that won't work because AWS is too expensive. More like, well, have you compared the costs of AWS versus our existing solution? 
So you're questioning in, in a sense, you're kind of leading, leading to more insight based on the questioning. Process. Yes, because even the questions, even the questions can have a lot of weight. Because somebody might hear, have you considered the costs of these two things? Oh no, I didn't. I should have. Why didn't I? Shit, I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> With the perspective you gained in your current role, what are the things you've learned about yourself in previous roles that you wish you could go back and tell yourself? Well, pretty much every one of the talks I give is something that I wish I had known a few years ago and that I've been learning the hard way. So everything we talk about here, uh, there's, there's this cliche about contracts. Uh, a contract is basically a history of ways people have screwed each other. Well, all of my tech talks are basically a history of ways I've screwed myself or other people. Um, and so everything in here, um, I think probably the one I would emphasize is listening. Uh, I think I'm a much, much better listener than I was five years ago or ten years ago. Um, not just better in terms of skill, but I didn't value it. Uh, five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, the way that I value it today. All the uh, speakers up here have probably been bombarded with uh, emails and phone calls from recruiters like me who are looking to take them to other major tech companies, uh, you know, other opportunities. But what keeps you here uh, versus all the other? potential places that you could go. Are you asking me to sell a company? <laughs> that sounds like a plan. That's a straight up plan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, great disguise, but <laughs> we, need to work, we need to work on that. <laughs> um, I help people get jobs. It's important. It may not be the single most important thing, you know, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it supplies a lot of them. And Every single company that contacts me has a pretty steep uphill climb to convince me that what they're doing is nearly as meaningful as what we're doing here. What also supports it is we have a fairly well-running business, and as a result of this well-running business, I get all of this you know, weird, constant change. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a change junkie, I'm a bit of a novelty junkie, and so I've had, you know, like the, the growth is satisfying to the ego, but also it just brings a whole new set of problems, although I can still apply computer architecture methods to them. It's a whole new set of things that keep me stimulated, that keep me engaged, that keep me excited. And then working for a company that's growing 50 plus percent year over year is pretty good from a financial perspective, although you know, there are a lot of companies that pay money, right? I would say it's interesting and it's not stopped being interesting even after nine years. And there are very few companies that do things that are as meaningful and important as what we do. Any other plans or questions? Uh, I can not maybe somebody more confident me on how hands my hands. We'll let this be the last question. <laughs> but you can give as many compliments as you want. <laughs> uh, with the uh, skip level meetings in the military, we call that career suicide. So uh, how do you get uh, or deal with the politics of like maybe push back or retribution of someone on the low level talking about their manager? To you when you skip over the hand. I think the first thing I do is get very angry, uh, which is not very productive, but um, the thing is, I think I think we have a healthy culture and we hire good managers. Um, and that helps a ton. We're very careful about the people that we hire in as managers and the people that we recruit internally to become managers from any individual contributors. And one of the things that we look for is the ability to take constructive feedback. Also, these managers are often getting constructive feedback from me if I'm their direct manager, or their direct manager if it's somebody else. So they should be able to handle it. Um, if you're doing skip levels and you're channeling information, you shouldn't be a blind pass-through. And you certainly should be careful about attributing the information that you're acting on, depending on how sensitive it is. So, Somebody tells me something alarming, I can't just take that as gospel, and I can't just go, hey, you know, like, Robin told me you were stealing office supplies. 
right? I, like that, that would be career <laughs> policy. Um, I, I need to say, you know, like, well, does does Robin suspect everybody of stealing stuff, or you know, just things like I need to do a little bit more investigation, and then when I talk to you about it, um, if there's actually something there, I need to be careful to one try to keep Robin out of it, two put it in terms of this is what you need to do to be more successful at this company. If you want to continue to work at this company, you should stop stealing the office supplies, <laughs> for example. Uh, but the thing is, like, criticism that's, uh, and, and you have to work with it sometimes. Sometimes criticism is just very acidly negative, but even within that, and that's where you have to work hardest as a leader, even within that, there's some fundamental thing that's not working, and you have to uncover what that thing is, and then turn it to something actionable. I, I can't have a meeting with you after skip levels with your report to say, like, dude, everybody hates you. So uh, enjoy that. See you. <laughs> you know, like, that, that, that would be the worst possible outcome. I could say, like, you know, people are anxious about what seems to be a pattern of conflict with you, where they're not seeing things eye to eye, and it's really degrading the morale on the team. I want to figure out how we can get you to having better relationships with the team, not just so you can be more productive with the team, but there are probably these things happening elsewhere, and it's going to hold you back from the goals that you have. Um, that's how I would try to address it. Is that? All right. Thanks everybody for uh, sticking around and and, uh, and giving your attention. Thanks, uh, to Kathan and and our other speakers for great talks. Let's give them another round of applause. We'll hang out for a few minutes, so stick around if you want to chat some more. <laughs>